Hello everyone. Welcome to Landing, Art and Market's second annual conference. My name is Alana Malika and I am the content manager at Art and Market. This is the first panel of Landing. The question for this session is, how do young artists navigate their artistic coming of age? The beginning of an artist's career is a liminal, liminal time where one constructs their identity and positionality within the art industry. What will emerge from, from a generation whose artistic coming of age coincides with a global pandemic, digital industrialization, and political unrest? This panel will join together artists from our Fresh Faces series who will speak about finding their niche in the Southeast Asian art world. Before we begin, I would like to thank everyone for spending the next 45 minutes with us, especially to our panelists who are coming in from all across the world. If you have any questions to ask the panelists, you can type it out anytime in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to them at the end during the question and answer segment. I am pleased to be speaking to Divagar, artist from Singapore. Hi, Diva. Hello. Hamonis Mongusam, artist from Thailand, tuning in from London. Hi. Hi. And Quinn Lam, artist from Vietnam, <clears throat> tuning in from Tennessee in the United States. Hi, everyone. OK. Um, let's not waste time starting. Let's dive into our first question. So what lessons from, from art school do you apply to your current art practice? Uh, Diva, if you would like to start. Um, yeah, um, so I guess my main takeaway from coming out of art school is um, sort of um, independence. Um, I think, you know, there's a wealth of knowledge in the world that's out there. Um, and I guess what art school sort of taught me was to always sort of to um, go for it and find out what I want to learn by myself. Um, because um, really there's nothing stopping you from picking up new skills and um, yeah, learning what you want to know. And I think that um, self-initiation, I guess, um, to sort of, um, you know, gather your own research and knowledge is um, yeah, one of the best takeaways from art school, I think. Yes, I think, yeah, just the um, hustle behind pursuing art because it's not necessarily a conventional career. Mm -hmm. I think, um, Quinn, would you like to um, add yeah. Yeah, I think that's very interesting that uh, Deepak has pointed out the points about skills. So this reminds me, um, I mean, as an artist from Vietnam, I, I'm, as you may know, I, I have like study in Vietnam before and then later in the US. So it's totally two different academic environments. So um, when uh, I was in Vietnam, I was trained uh, kept by as a painter, I mean, like my background in painting, and so just doing some like figurative painting, uh, like technical technical painting, and kind of like um, Russian traditional uh, anatomy art. So I think that also, I mean, I get some benefits from um, like the ability to master all of these skills. But when I'm in the US. It's totally different because that's more about like cultural diversity. I mean, like the cultural background, and it's more involved conversation from um, people from different um, field. Like, I mean, that we have like studio, open studio, and have critique, like more about discussions, and yeah, that's. Um, and also because I'm more into like experimental work, so that's give me more chance to um, pushing my words more in a slight different way. We see I'm now like very like interdisciplinary, <laughs> like doing a lot of, I, I mean, a little bit of many different things, <laughs> performance, video, installation. Um, yeah, but also like sometimes painting, drawing. Mm. <laughs> that's a really important to note how academic context influences your art practice now 
because that's you know that's what you learn. Yeah, I, I agree with Queen. How how you know B and MA is really different, and I think beyond the concept is also you know um, the age that we are we were in during my BA. You know, I think is the most crucial time for self discovery and learn how to express yourself in a constructive way and put that into art. Learn how to you know construct my thinking, my reflection, and you know make it into art and but with MA is you know much more different I think I think because I did my MA right after my BA I feel like I had to almost adapt myself so quickly and I guess what I got most from MA was to learn like adult mentality to be among to be among you know other older people and to adapt my thinking and how would I engage my my art within the within the group like a small group within the classroom that fall into the bigger group of people so I guess what I got most from MA is how would I engage my skills and you know my practice into a bigger world yeah, I think it's um, great that you mentioned self-discovery because I think that's a really important part of one's art practice and how they could organically offer something authentic to the art world. Because, you know, artists, they have to tap into their worldview and personal identity to inform their practice. So, um, Quinn, how have, your, how have your research interests on post-war trauma influenced your work? Oh, so um, as you may know, like I, Vietnam has been dealing just a long time with um, wars, uh, uh, like from the first Indochina wars, and then the second Indochina war, which we all know, like Vietnam War, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, so something, um, I, I mean, like from the beginning, uh, my starting point with some of my family handwriting letter and family photograph. So I, um, I, my curiosity led me to like try to explore more about the context and the story behind the photo. Um, so um, I, I did some uh, kind of like research space, but at, the mo at that time, back to like more than like 10 years ago, I, I'm not very really sure like what I'm doing until when um, like time by time and then the project developed. So uh, I realized that's not, that's not only about personal, like something like intimacy, personal memory history, but also to um, tie with the national histories. And then so the post-war trauma is part of my main team. So I work with like, um, yeah, like translate. Um, I mean, I call that like transplanters of something like um, the Vietnamese community um, inside and outside the countries. Um, yeah, so something to do with also the metaphor. But that, we can talk about that later because that's a long story. <laughs> Yes, um, we'll definitely circle back. So that sounds very interesting. <laughs> I think, yeah, you mentioned a lot about how national identity also influence or influences your personal, um, I guess, standings with things. And I think it's interesting to note how um, a lot of the practice is looking outwards to then look inwards. Mm -hmm. I think um, Kamado Sandiva. Um, yeah. I understand that you, you guys have interests in feminist critical theory and queer spaces respectively. So how do these, um, how do these um, interests and topics help form your identity as an artist? Yeah. Uh, should I go first? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so for me, I guess, um, in, in some ways, like formal academia and theory sort of comes um, supplementary to um, like my personhood and identity as, um, you know, a racialized person, 
percent of a certain identity. And, um, you know, I think that's really true, like living and experiencing um, like what you get as a person of certain identity, um, you know, it really does inform like your worldview or your view as an artist for me. Um, and I think, you know, um, queer theory and feminist theory sort of um, intersect. In, yeah, it, they intersect and they sort of like give like more foundation and you know, um, it really does further develop your um, like point of view as an artist when you're developing your work. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think because in academia, you're kind of taught things in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. You're learning science when you're learning science and you're learning humanities when you're learning humanities. But in reality, like identities, these things intersect and they inform each other and they kind of compound in, on top of each other. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, um, Kamoros, do you have anything else to add? I mean, in terms of like shaping my own identity within like, you know, my art practice, I think it, it, was, it was growing. I mean, feminism was growing within me alongside the art, you know? So since teenager, when I was practicing or do, the, the my doing my art practice I was also into like maybe starting with feminism and art book and then you know moving into more like feminist theory and so I guess I was almost you know growing up with it growing up with a feminist term feminist way of thinking and that also shaped the way I I make art and you know for my just for my identity yeah, um, mm -hmm. I think I can see how, you know, your practice grows, like you mentioned, with you as an artist. I think it's also interesting that all of you are interdisciplinary artists with multiple mediums under your belt. For example, Kamoros, I understand that you penned a poetry book titled Ross Flowers. So this is an open question for everyone. How do you translate your artistic identity across different mediums? Well, since, since you mentioned about um, my um, poetry book, um, I mean, in, in, uh, I always start with some sort of writing in my journal and, you know, in, in all my projects, really, whether the, the outcome would have text in it or not. Um, with that poetry book, it was a collection of bits and bobs that I wrote in my journal between when I was um, 18 to 21. So yeah, the, I, I just reread it now when, you know, um, like yesterday. And I think it's, I think it's a great capture of, of that energy, you know, because in, in the book, it, I talk a lot about kind of sexuality and everything. So, so, um, so I guess I translate in the different way, say the poetry book, I gather and I construct like a, a structure from what I was written expressively. Whereas now when I, I've been working on a couple of other poetry books as well and the way I constructed this, this really different I would start from the structure first nowadays and you know kind of plan all the structure and then go within within each chapter or each element that I want to to create yeah I think having that organization of a book format is a lot different um than traditional art um I think Diva you yeah um, your work, Ideal Homes, Yeah, I think it has, um, it brings about a lot of necessary commentary about mm -hmm. negotiating, spa negotiating space in terms of like housing, um, as a queer person, um, do you, could you tell us more about that in terms of how it has influenced yeah. artistic identity? 
in this medium? Yeah, so I guess maybe um, just like a little backstory to that. It's, um, really, it's a work that's quite reflective of where I've been um, looking for housing as a queer person. Um, and um, because in Singapore, there's so many restrictions about home ownership or, um, yeah, so a lot of queer people who are below the age of 35, they end up going, um, they end up renting houses um, because public housing is so expensive, right? Um, yeah, so, um, and another like sort of backstory to that was um, prior to that series of work, um, I was a painter <laughs> and um, I did drawing, painting, all the traditional stuff. And uh, it wasn't until I worked in a gallery that I sort of understood how spaces can sort of inform and um, present to you the sort of experience of a space. And um, that was my main sort of takeaway into um, delving into installation and videos because um, I guess it's the immersiveness of um, these media that, um, that I really wanted to use because, um, you know, I think art has, a, for me, like has a sort of problem in sort of translating or um, presenting an, like an idea or an experience and, um, you know, something that can be felt rather than read or um, communicate that is um, to me where my sort of um, comfort zone is in sort of presenting art in that sense. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's very insightful. And I think just um, mm. hearing into kind of what you mentioned a bit about like hustling, um, because a, a career as an artist, it often means relying on project-based income. For example, right. <laughs> um, I know you have several um, long-term projects under your belt, including history of color. Um, so how have you dealt with um, balancing between the commercial pressures of, pressures of art while also still exploring your artistic identity as it goes, and how has this affected kind of your workflow? Well, so um, in terms of commercial, um, I remember long, long, long times ago when I first had some uh, like painting shows, and uh, uh, I I will not mention the name, but it's just like. Um, something like private conversations and like the gallery owner who's like, I have a location in Vietnam just told me like, oh, you have to like sell your work quickly and like downgrade the price which I, I, I feel like it doesn't sound right to me. And, and I remember that person also told me that if I didn't do that in the, the, the right way, so I, like I will kill myself. And I, I guess I was still like very young at that time. And I said, okay, but um, I, I just step back because I, I, I don't feel like I would prefer to do something that I, I don't feel comfortable. Uh, I mean, like I feel uncomfortable to like feel um, create my work in the means of production. So, uh, and I am more into research space I mean, like research based projects. So, um, and uh, it's more ties with something like in this institutions. And, uh, and I prefer to do residency and also have, like, uh, for example, like the piece that you mentioned, History of Color. Um, that's one was curated by Mizuki Endo. And um, uh, the also, like, a commission work that I, um, just like dedicate that work by like using the local flower on the from Hanoi uh, because the, the venue was at the VCCA Vincon Center Contemporary Art. So yeah, so I, I feel like 
that's something like the the way for me to go like yeah I would rather to do something like that for that too like, like something like satisfy somebody else's desire um hope that I I address your question but if not they can you can elaborate more and we can continue to talk I think yeah that's that's very um it's very nice to hear that you advocated for yourself and stood your ground because I think um with the society that we live in especially in this industry there's a lot of pressure to commodify your art and sometimes resisting it also risks your um just your life your livelihood I think Amoros, your piece, Second Best, I think it paints a very um, accurate portrayal of just um, how sometimes feminism is misconstrued as fighting for women to, for women to um, participate in the workforce and essentially become men when it's actually more about um, dismantling the structures that oppress women, including um, such over, like, overly capitalistic stru structures. So um, do you, uh, could you explain more about this? I don't feel too much pressure from the commercial part in the art, I guess, because like after my BA, when I, you know, was still living in Bangkok and I didn't have a representation at the time. I didn't have a, a solo exhibition in Bangkok at the time, but I, I was able to find support that would, and also, you know, at the time I was doing very, some, some work were quite, I would say uncollectible or that's what most people would say, but at that time, I was able to find support that would support the kind of work that I was doing. Or, and that was really important because as a young artist, it made me realize anything can sell. So from then I, I would keep on, you know, make, continue my practice in the way. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, would attract, you know, some people and you know basically I don't feel like I need to change my practice into the you know some major commercialized part in the art world and in terms of like work and balance you know um, I think I think the the mental health balance is also really important because it's something I I what I try to do in London because you know, I was able to um, live in Bangkok out of my art, but here in London, I would sometimes have to get a part-time job, which I always, I always take a non-art part-time job just to, you know, keep my mental health away from, you know, and just focus on my art in the art part. So, yeah. Yeah, I think there's, um, I have very similar views to you too, because um, yeah, I think a lot of my art is also kind of uncollectible in a sense. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, a lot of it is, um, I guess for me, um, true, because when, I think there's a lot to be taken out of non-art work as well. Um, for me, um, even helping people out, um, doing odd jobs, you kind of take a lot of life lessons away from that, that you kind of can, it sort of finds its way back into the art in a, in a way for me. So I don't know if that's true for you. Yeah, that's same to me since my world is kept by ephemeral works, like something to do with decaying and ephemeral. So I remember like from the beginning, I start to like, creating pigments from the material which is I use flower and plants and vegetations but then later I have to switch from painting and drawing like instead of applying that on paper canvas 
I start to do something like to apply the material on the walls and then how to research the smell, like something like multi-sensory piece within the installations. And also sometimes I use the planes uh, cap a uh, sculpture and film them like all of the stage of the canes in the video piece. So that's just like one material, but in a, so many different formats. So it's just like, it's still there, but it's like moving around and around. So like the concept uh, leads me to decide the formats, like the medium that I can pick like, for the project. Yeah, I think um, it's interesting that you all talked about having people call your art uncollectible, especially installation pieces. I think that's a common, I guess it's a common experience for interdisciplinary artists like yourselves. Um, but now things have shifted because the pandemic, it really has revealed the fragilities and resilience, well, and also the resilience um, of the art industry while also ushering this like digital transformation um, so Diva, I noticed that your practice has shifted to focus more on digital mediums as of recently, including your presentation of soft selves, which a lot like Quinn's um, use of organic materials, um, it's also like a digital um, exhibition with um, digital art mag. Could you tell us more about this? Yeah, so um, soft selves is, um, it's, I guess a project on sort of East um, non-Western medicine in that sense um, by the Singapore Heritage Fest um, that um, Rural Art Met produced. And for that exhibition, um, you know, while it was like a digital exhibition, we did have to do a lot of um, physical, um, you know, processes in real life, the photography, staging, collecting materials. Um, and I guess um, it's kind of like a funny way to think about um, traditional medicine in a, like a completely digital format as well. Um, yeah, so for that project, um, I hired a model, Shavita, and she sort of, um, we sort of um, did this whole um, fictitious influencer um, blog style post uh, for the exhibition where she's going through her journey and learning about Indian traditional medicine. <laughs> um, as far as like, I guess the shift to the digital, um, I guess it's necessary to keep diversifying like your working method and styles because, um, you know, uh, it's hard for people to head outside to, um, to galleries, to uh, museums during a pandemic um, to see something. Um, I, I think, you know, I'm tapping into a lot of like my skills um, in design and, um, you know, through, what do you learn um, through exhibition preparation, doing floor plans and all these things. Um, these all sort of translate in some way to what's, um, I guess now where we're sort of tasked to do all these digital exhibitions as well. So for me, it's really just taking all these skills from elsewhere and putting it into that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah I really liked just also how it doubles as a commentary on influencer culture, because there are actually a lot of fake influencers on Instagram. So it's, <laughs> it's interesting to um, also lean into that um, observation. I think, um, Quinn, I know that you had a piece titled Quarantine, Quarantine during um, the beginning of quarantine. Uh, so, yeah, this is also a question for Kamalarsis. How has the pandemic kind of affected your practice? Uh, should I go first or Kamalarsis? I, yeah. So um, I remember when COVID first hit uh, in the US, 
um, in March 2020. Um, at that time, everyone is kept like very <laughs> in the chaotic situations and not really what will happen next. And yeah, so I had to move my studio to my apartment and like, because I was not able to access the building and then everywhere is locked. And uh, yeah, so we just like mostly spending time in our own space. And um, yeah, and around May, uh, I mean like two months later, I also participate in another kind of like digital platform, uh, which is organized by Mana Contemporary Art based in New Jersey, Chicago and Miami but they push that online and in partnership with CADAF. Yeah, so the, that's what my, my first experience to like having some of my piece, but in a virtual venue. And mm -hmm. they push that like in the art fair, like art base or something. So it's bring people like very fresh experience and still be able to come to like, because so many um, exhibitions being postponed and canceled. So, and I guess by, by that time, uh, when Mana doing something like that, um, it's encouraged artists feel like more um, motivation to keep curating work and working on what we are still doing, but just in a, in a new normal, just, and, um, and then um, because I also had the habits, just like my routine daily life, I, I drink tea and, um, yeah, so I, I usually like keep my used tea bag and um and when it's just like more and more and more and more, I I was thinking right, I want to do something with that. And um like it's also um I mean the, the COVID time gave me more time to like reflex myself in a very different way. And um I start with just like the idea to using the tea bag to marking time, I mean like mark, marking time and like counting my every single day during uh, that year and until now I still continue like that but not really sure how about this to 2021 like this year's when the vaccines also um, start to be like spreading around the world so we will see what will happen next. So yes, for me, I had I had the same quite the same experience at the beginning as well because you know, um, I was in London then and the government announced the lockdown. I think two three days before it happened. I, I remember I was in my studio, so but I, it's just I didn't have I didn't um, have time to move my studio or my stuff into my home. So in a way, just the studio you know became like this expensive storage for months and yes I had to work at home and at that time I, I think it was quite interesting because everybody had to work at home and um yeah I was and you know how working from home used to be for artists and especially female artists used to be considered quite a feminine art or sometimes might say some might say like unprofessional way of working from home or from the bedroom and and you know I think that was a that was a really interesting phenomenon that everybody worked from home and but I guess what 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 I what I really has taken on from that time of working from home is that I actually work really enjoy working from home and you know just waking up and you know, read some books, make art or write something. So from that experience kind of led me to applying to this work and leave residency where I, I can just wake up and start making art without having to, you know, go all the way to central London. Yeah, I think um, now that we're looking forward of possibly a life after the pandemic. Um, what is one career aspiration in brief that you hope to achieve? Well, I guess this is 
my not only my old aspirations, but also many other artists, um, especially in Southeast Asia. I think um, I really want to um, have the world know more uh, familiar with like the Southeast Asia regions, like all about the rich cultures and like, yeah, many like about geographies and uh, all of the histories, like just spread through the works and many other stories. So yeah, just something simple, but still like something very important. <laughs> yeah. Um, Diva, come on, do you have anything you wanna manifest, I guess? <laughs> oh. <laughs> manifest. Um, I mean, um, I don't really have like specific aspirations. Um, I have, um, I, I guess for me, it's um, kind of just remembering to stay true to, you know, um, have maintain integrity basically um, in art. Because I think along the way, you have a lot of projects where um, you kind of do it because um, it's money or reputation, but it's also for me, I guess, maintaining that sense of like perspective, a uh, sense of self, your point of view, everything. Um, yeah, that's what it's for me. Yeah, yeah mine is quite simple as well. I think I think we all want to find ways to sustain our practice and you know, definitely to get deeper and deeper to what they're interested in and what they're doing and, you know, to be able to go through all the ups and downs along the way. Yeah, I think just keeping, keeping going, that's something really important that people sort of um, don't realize should be an aspiration. So we have a question from the audience. Um, Richard asks, as young artists, how important is establishing a network and would you prefer to stay or work abroad um, or return to your countries as a base? So I guess this is a question about, um, you know, forming a network oh. and also just your preferences um, about st um, staying abroad or going local. Well, um, first of all, thank you, Richard, for having a very, like, this is really good questions. And I also think, like, for me, the network is very important. Um, remember, like, a long time ago, like, um, in Vietnam, um, we it's like, just like have some, like, kind of, like, funding. And then if artists doesn't really know, like, in, I mean, like, in the community. So it's really very difficult to have information like nowadays when everything like online and easy to access. But like, if we have like friends and like our maybe like mentor or just like, and it's just like, oh, hey, this opportunity maybe fits with your practice and uh, you should apply. So that would be something very benefits from the network. Um, so I, I guess, um, let me look at the question again. Um, to establish, establish in the network and prefer to stay on the board. Um, for, for the question to stay or uh, work abroad, I think um, um, this reminds uh, me some of other, um, like Richard's um, mentioned about like the Indochina, I mean, the, the Indochina artists. Um, usually like in Vietnam and stay in France. And so um, that's something in the past, but uh, nowadays I, I feel like mostly artists has to be like based in their home country and also based in somewhere else. And some artists also have like, maybe a little like two, three studio in Europe, in Taipei and yeah. So that can be like from a view of people who living in between a two cultural like right now for me, but uh, not sure that I address the question really well. <laughs> yeah, I, I think for me, because I guess I've, I've only ever practiced in Singapore, um, you know, I think 
the opportunity to expand overseas would be great. Um, but also, um, you know, I think establishing a network in itself is one of those things where, um, yes, it is utilitarian also, but, um, you know, having established connections here, I think that's, um, you know, at some point it's not just utilitarian, it also has to be like a genuine like connection and so on, right? Um, yeah, I think like sincerity is important. Um, yeah, make friends. <laughs> yeah, making friends is definitely important, especially right now. Um, Amoris, do you have um, a take on this or would you like me to continue? Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm reading Richard's question again. I think I just actually had a deja vu because I think Richard came to talk to um, Bangkok University when I was studying. I think, I think I asked the same question as the audience about being based like abroad or at the local. But um, um, and for, so for me now, um, so for now, I'm, um, I'm in London now, but I feel like... Um, I feel like, you know, in, in Thai, in, in the Thai art world, for me, is I think it's like, it's like a family. Every time I come back to Thailand, so I go between these two places for now, I'm probably in the next um, three years and a half, because now I'm, uh, uh, I have this live and work uh, studio at Acme in London, so, so I think I would go back and forth between these two because in London I still have um, other fields that I want to explore, especially in feminism. And I think that goes to um, networking with new people and outside of the art world as well in my you know, interest in feminism. Okay, um, I think, yeah, that's a good note to end. It is definitely, um, I think we are all right now living sort of that double, because most of our life is online. And um, yeah, so I think it's time to wrap up. Thank you everyone for sp spending the last 45 minutes with us. And thank you especially for our panelists, especially those who have come during a awkward time. So thank you, Kamaros, Quinn, and Diva for the co engaging conversation. So if you would like to catch all of the other panel discussions on, in Landing, please visit artandmarket.net slash landing. Landing continues the conversations from our annual publication, Check-In. The e-version is free for all to read on artandmarket.net slash check-in. There is also a limited print run of Check-In. We would greatly appreciate it if you would consider purchasing a physical copy of check-in, which would go towards programming at a &M, such as the panel discussion that you have attended today. Thank you and see you all soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.